Um, before I go further, <clears throat> give me a few topics that we'll cover today. Pardon? Spontaneity. Spontaneity. Now, what came brought that up? Spontaneity. The angel with the bitter sweet look. An angel? The, the angel in Revelation with the bitter sweet oh, look. Yeah. The rainbow eyes. Oh, you're, yeah, you're a Revelation guy from last week. <laughs> angel, book. <laughs> Spit. That's the bitter symbol I'm doing. Like, Bleh. that means bitter. Okay, anyone else? Appreciation. Appreciation. Patience and appreciation. Uh, balance between service to others and service to self. I only have so four fingers. <laughs> Patience. What was the other one? Appreciation. End of the virus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have patience? Uh, yeah, really. Appreciation. <laughs> So, all right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. So, where we are in our lives. And incidentally, if, if, if you're new watching online or in the room and you get tempted to think, well, what kind of spiritual leader or spiritual teacher is he? He went up there and, you know, he doesn't have his notes. He's unprepared. You know, academically, this would look terrible. But thank God, I don't really care um, <laughs> how it looks, you know. Um, uh, yeah, we seem to survive, you know, with, with trusting God instead, which, oh, great one. That was a good point. Um, so that just popped into a, a nice download. It's, it's very true that people have forgotten who they are. People talk about this concept of, of what does it take to sustain life? And this is interesting because they say air, food, water. And you, you don't hear God in there, even though God's the source of air, food, and water. It's just air, food, and water, which is a materialistic view, if you think about it. Air, food, water. But then I remember this came up where somebody, I heard a couple people talking about it, and they couldn't agree, air, food, and then they, one would add something else. And so I thought, I'm, I'm going to check that. I, like, almost never go and Google something. I almost never. And I went and Googled it, and it was bizarre because they would say air, food, water. Another would add a fourth thing. And then there would be a list of seven, and then somebody else, ten, the 12 things that are essential. And you know, all they kept doing is adding things, like, and happiness. And one was the 10 primary things, and the top was success. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> all they did is that the essentials just got worse. I understand air, food, water. Try and have good air, food, water if you don't have light, sun. Try to grow the food if you don't have sun. Agriculture is not going to do well if they're... So even the sunlight, and nobody had that one. I understand that they weren't going to have God light because that's expecting a bit too much from humans. But think about it. They didn't have sunlight, but even still, the light of God. We're, we're, we are sustained only by the light of God. So... This concept of being a godless people, the Israelites went through this consistently, where their prophets would say, you have become, we have become godless, and there will be retribution for that. It's not like God is up in heaven going, I feel so, God, you know, like unappreciated. I'm going to teach them a lesson. This is our own consciousness. There's a part of us that knows only God matters. So when we know that unconsciously, but we don't live it consciously, that's called a conflicting message inside. And so 
there are these things happening. One of you brought up virus. One of you brought up revelation. There are these things happening in the world. Guys, this is going to continue grinding people into powder until they recognize we've steered too far away. Now, personally, I can't stand you know, up at a podium and say, you better get with the Lord or you're going to... God doesn't want you to find God through suffering. But if that's the only way you can get there, great. But that tells us you're living the old dispensation. That I, I can only grow by suffering. Remember, I've said this many times with addiction. They say you have to reach bottom. No, you don't. You could also just enjoy the top. Think about this. Oh, you know, you can't really, you know, work on addiction until you've reached bottom. You, th that's because they're counting on you not having any brightness in your head. There can be something in us that says, you know, I kind of like healthiness. Do I have to be near death before I make a change in my life? Do, do I have to have all my family members doing an intervention before? Do I have to get fired before? Guys, no. Why do people forget the light? Because deep, deep down, we're afraid of the light of God. It's this whole message of people are afraid of God's wrath. That's old school, which is valid if you're an old school person. You and I are being given the right for the last 2,000 years and now and future to say, you know, because it makes sense. We don't have to suffer anymore. Epidemics and pandemics and these things are only symbols of our own inner conflict. So there's, there are three stages that we go through. I use that symbol in a lot of teachings because it's true and valid. It's beautiful. Thank you. But one of them is that anytime you want to make a change in your life, you have to initiate the change. You have to access some new sanity or the old is going to keep beating you up. So something's got to, like, I've got to initiate a change. That's not that challenging. But really stubborn humans, it just, the topic just never comes up till they're almost dead, divorced, or collapsing in some other way. You know, dark night of the soul. Ask people. The majority of people in this world, especially old school, found spirituality and religion when things fell apart. In our generation, it started happening. People started finding God when it just made sense. They just, wow, I saw somebody else's happiness level. Somebody else's brightness. I, I saw a teaching. I heard a teaching. I read a book. that just made sense. That's the new way. It's called the easier way versus learning the hard way. So the first step in, in making a change for you becoming a new person or having a new life, creating a new life, the first step is that you have to initiate it. You've got you've to access something new. So it does take some initiative. But that stage is easy. Technically, I could say there's three stages and any one of them can be challenging differently to different people because we all have our different weaknesses, let's call it. To some person, you know, one person it could be the first stage is the challenging one. To another person it's the second, another person the third, another person it's a blend. But the first stage generally is fairly easy. And there's people that, that post things online on YouTube and Facebook and all that say, um, and, and I mean, it's mind-boggling to, to be in this position I'm in and have someone say, I don't know if you understand this, Michael, but my life was near like death, you know. I, my life was falling apart. Nothing made sense. I was losing everything. And I saw a talk on, and it would be something that I might even think, well, that was kind of a simple conversation I was having uh, in a live presentation or whatever. They might have caught just a couple minutes, and it meant everything to them. And that's not just because well, Michael's an amazing teacher. Someone had to have consciously or unconsciously consciously said, I'm ready to initiate a change. But oh my God, to be like locked into that with them, that synchronistic poof, that's, 
That's phenomenal. It's an amazing feeling. It's, it's almost awe-inspiring. But, but I know that it's not like when people will say, Michael, and you're amazing, and, and that's very nice, and I am. But <clears throat> the amazing thing ultimately is God is behind the food and the water and the air. It's ultimately all they're finding is God. Me? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a representation. But if they weren't ready and open and willing to create and initiate a change in their life, I wouldn't have been on the screen. You see what I'm saying? So that's the magic. Is that something in them had to have said, now sometimes it's consciously. Sometimes they go, God, I need help. And these, they're in pain or they're in tears. And to hear some of those testimonials, guys, I mean, that's just, wow. It really is pretty powerful. And to hear people say, and, and Michael, I specifically said, God, there's an area of my life. And I mean, it could be something so arbitrary. There's no way this, you know, the following could be like coincident. They could say, uh, I have a, a, a death, deathly phobia about certain colored chairs. And Michael used that as an example in a talk. Things that are so arbitrary, it can only be the magic of synchronicity, divine synchronicity, that Michael would even bring that up. I mean, that's how it is sometimes. But still, something in that person had to be ready. Something in them had to have either said, I need help, or unconsciously, their soul was saying, you know what? It's getting old, this human part of you that won't open up. I'm just going to override you. And the soul like locks it in. And then the person sitting there going, well, what just happened? And it feels really amazing. Like it is like a spontaneous, profound, poof, healing. Whether it's in body, mind, soul, they feel some amazing, incredible experience because they watched or heard or sat here with us and so on. And it's all true. It's beautiful. But I find it humorous in that it's part of them that had to have been ready. So when people say to me, well, how do, what do I do with this, this feeling of, of, I watched the show and you were right on line and right in sync and do I become a member of you? You know, all that stuff. They want, you know, they want to know what to do with it. And I always try to remind people, this is about you. Sure, I, I'm playing a role. And say thank you, that's fine. And you, that's all beautiful. But more and more, we have to understand this is us, which brings us to the second stage of any change in our lives. The first stage, you've got to initiate it. If you're wanting a change, you're going, I'm going to watch this guy, you know, because I'm wanting to initiate a change. But you sit there passively, like you're not choosing it. It's less powerful or potent. You have to re and go, you know, recognize and go, this is making sense. Wait, I was just praying about, wait, oh my God. This is me, and an answer is coming. You start to realize your value. So initiating a change is step one. Step two is integrating the change, and that can be a tough one. That's when you have to go, the book I read is, this is a magical experience, but it is reflecting my awakening, my awareness, my readiness. The second step is also challenging because it involves becoming the change. You know, it's like you don't just hear it and think about it and talk about it. You, know, you don't just read it. It's you, you participate. And that's why I would say that's typically the most challenging step. The third step is easy at the end of the day. That's where, well, for some people, that's where you just generally, you, you initiate, you become, and then Spirit, I talked about this last week. Then all of a sudden, Spirit, God, shows up. Well, God was never gone. So that part generally is easy. But we, where we run into a problem with the third stage is that it could also be called maintaining the change. I initiate a change. I integrate a change. I have to maintain the change. And yes, for some people, that's the ch challenging one. But if I believe if you integrate your changes enough, maintaining them is easier. Is that making sense? Yep. If you really initiate it enough, maintain it, maintaining it becomes just like, um, just becomes easier. If you really don't get it, for example, uh, somebody said the other day, you know, like so doing something like fasting or breaking free of an addiction. They're like, oh my God, I could never. 
You can never because you never initiated it and stayed with it, uh, integrated the changes. When you integrate it, you see the value of getting away from a, a dysfunctional relationship or an addiction. When you really get it, maintaining it becomes easier. When you're still going, oh, but, 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 uh, you know, you haven't totally integrated the change. That's why the drink can still talk to you. It, that's why it can still have a conversation with you. The person's going, but I just can't stop that voice because you haven't totally in the middle stages, you still haven't totally learned the value of saying no to the past and yes to the future. You're still non-committal, you could call it. So those are the sta stages we go through. And it was brought up this concept in the book of Revelation. Why, why was it mentioned in the book that there's this moment where he, John says, and I was seeing this book with, when it's ingested, it's going to first taste sweet, but it turns bitter. That's relevant to what we're talking about here. Change is going to seem sweet and easy at first, unless it's, you know, court, mandatory court ordered. Um, <laughs> change is generally going to seem, you know, like even entering a nice relationship or getting out of one. It seems like pretty positive. Winning the lottery, that's a change. Seems positive. A new wardrobe or whatever, getting a raise at work. Changes can seem fairly positive. And it's see, especially when chosen by us, or you wouldn't be choosing it. So it's generally positive, and that's the book, the Revelation's telling you. At first, sweet, but then it turns bitter or sour in the stomach. What it's talking about there is, in a sense, all forms of materialism and addiction. The things you think are going to make you happy seem sweet at first, and they turn bitter. The book, it's described as a book, you know, when ingested, this is what it does. Because the book means my truth. This is my reality. Every day that I ingest my version of reality, it seems like I'm going to get by and it's going to seem pretty sweet. Why does it always turn sour? Because nothing in this world, your food, your air, your water is going to sustain you. It's going to turn on you, this world. Elect anybody you want. They're going to turn on you. No matter how they seem, if you're honest, you're going to realize. And how long it sustains a sweetness depends on your level of denial. That's what it is. It's, it's better for people just to go, okay, even if you're going to go vote for somebody, do not put all of your sweet expectations upon that person. The human beings who think they're sustained by water, food, and air instead of God, which means they're always living the soured book. They're always living it. Do I want that person as my guide? You know, someone who's, who's always off mentally? No, no. God is all that really sustains us. And if you get somebody who says, oh, no, I'm always just positive and bright and ascended in consciousness, that may be true. They may feel that way, which is a really beautiful blessing. But also what's nice is when you and I can just say, no, that's my intention, but there are days where things still go sour. And, and this is the new dispensation of, of Christ consciousness, which we went through the, the old guilt and shame for many years, and we still live in that to some degree. But we also shifted to, oh, well, Jesus came about, and so now everything's fine. All you have to do is sometime before your last breath, just go, I accept Jesus as my personal savior. I'm good to go. Like, so there's some e-ticket, like you're at Disneyland with the old e-tickets. I get to go on any ride, you know? And then you're like, eh, e-ticket, e-ticket. You go on a few rides, then you go, hi, ah, e-ticket. I'm out of e-tickets. And now you have a reincarnation ticket. You know, you just have to come back and deal with the things you tried to escape. This Christ consciousness thing is not Jesus covering for you. You're still you. And whatever your issues are, until you are holy, you're coming back until you're holy. But there's a trick. We used to think, okay, we're going to either be the rare mystics, yogis that are getting perfected, which is very few that made it that way. Or you're going to try to become the Christian mystic that's, you know, Jesus, and I'm going to be perfect, and I'm never going to think a naughty thought. That's very stressful. <laughs> 
the, the easy way, the, the real, the secret to all of this is instead forgiveness to say, well, you know, there's, they're trying real hard. I mean, there's just also the, the sleeping humans. Once you start waking up, you kind of never really want to go back to sleep. If you really, if you really initiated the change of yourself to higher consciousness and you started integrating, it's really hard to pretend you don't know any of that because you've already integrated it. You know, it's like drinking something that soured and it wasn't supposed to be and going, I probably just should have stopped drinking that upon the first notice that the first gulp was bad. <laughs> 10 gulps later, I'm, I'm in for the hall now. Like I'm there. Now this is, this is going to be my experience for a little while. It's like that, except in a positive sense. I make changes. I integrate the changes. Whew, you know, it's really hard to go back to sleep. People have tried and people do go to a degree, but it's really hard to go back to sleep. So this idea of, of, I really want to work at being a spiritual soul and I try really hard. That's great. You'll, you'll always have that with you on some level, but you're still trying to get to the perfection yourself. The only secret shortcut is of course, to do everything with God. But if you do everything with God, you'll realize it's not, I'm going to perfect myself. That's, that's the old version of the new school that we came about some time ago. Instead, what we have to do is say, I of myself am nothing. I can try to eat perfectly. I can try to do whatever perfectly. And still, I see where I slip and forgive myself. That's the guy who becomes Christed. The one that recognizes their dependence upon Christ. Christ what? Christ Jesus? Christ, is it Christ Jesus only? Christ, period. The Christ that was in Jesus, let that be born in you as well. The one that found perfection through forgiveness is waiting to teach me that. Yeah, but where is he? And somebody wrote in an email this week and said, uh, maybe it's on YouTube that said, uh, can you answer this one question that nobody seems to have answered? What does it mean when they say, Jesus himself said, there will come a day where people will say, here is Christ. Look, over there is Christ. Come over here. There's Christ. And, and you know, like it sounds like they're false prophesying. Here's Jesus. There's, and so the fundamental Christians take it that way. And they think it's a false version of there's Jesus and there, you know, and, and in a literal sense, which is partly true as well. What he was saying was, as soon as someone's telling you, listen to the wording carefully, look, over there is Christ. Get the first word. Look, as soon as you open your eyes to look with your senses, you will not see Christ. That's what he was telling you. It'll be not true. And what he was telling you was, it can't be true. Because as soon as you open your eyes to see something that's found within, you can't see it. Oh, that's good stuff, isn't it? You know? I just, you know, I'm like, oh, ooh. so you open your eyes, then you'll close this eye, close these eyes, open this eye, and then you, the light of Christ. All that you've done, all that I've done, you shall do and more. And it's about opening consciousness. It's about recognizing, my God, I'm not settling anymore. I'm going to initiate awakening. Now, now be careful. Don't ask for more than you feel you can handle. If you leave a talk like this and say, oh, that was so inspiring. Oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to end every addiction today. Like <laughs> now, every addiction. And then you start finding out, really? Because food is also an addiction. Any th time you thought you were hungry and thought that food filled you, when you don't have a body and you don't have a stomach, it's all an illusion. That's an addiction. Oh, okay, then I won't eat. Okay, what about water? <gasps> I won't drink anything anymore. What about air? The three things they say sustains you. <gasps> I won't breathe. You know, really, how far are you going to go with this? You, you took it too seriously. Stop. What, what is reasonable for you today? I'm going to set my course today to a new level of focus and no settling allowed. That's step one if you choose it that beautifully. Secondly, I also am going to initiate or integrate 
all the lessons along the way. What have I learned in my past that I can integrate today? What am I learning in this moment that could make a brighter future for me? I'm going to integrate all my lessons and changes, everything I've ever healed. If you want to ask about ascension, it takes the same three things. If you want to know about having miracles, same three things. Attaining forgiveness, same three things. Any conversation you want to have, it's the same three things. Even if you were saying, I want to become a carpenter, you know, an artist, you still have to set the course, you have to integrate the studies and the learning, and you have to maintain the course. The third is tricky, because spiritually, God will bring you the effects of you setting your course and integrating changes. God's already going to be waiting for you there. It's not like God wasn't there, it's God's waiting do your first two, God starts to show up. But you will have to maintain your course. And a lot of people deviate when it comes to maintaining their course. They start to deviate because the book becomes sour. They start to deviate because they don't see the things they want to see out here. They start to deviate because before they reach that third stage where you start to really, it's like I am, now it's being. I'm not becoming, I'm being this presence. I I feel it in my mind, body, soul. It's amazing. And it's going to ask you to maintain the course because it's easy. It's still easy to become distracted. It's still easy to believe that you don't deserve all that you've attained. You might be working on again on forgiveness and then something comes up and makes you go, Oh my God, he brought up Michael or whomever, you know, brought up, a. um, issues with fathers-in-law, and I noticed I got a little sick to my stomach when he did. I thought I had worked on that. There's that voice again, trying to make you doubt your progress. Stay the course. What are you supposed to do? See it, initiate, access that I just saw myself slipping. Bounce back and say, but I don't slip for as long as I used to. That's integrating change. And then back to forgiving yourself. Turn everything back around again. Turn everything back around and keep turning everything back around. One of you asked about patience. That's how you achieve patience. See, you will never actually have patience running things, your life, the way it's always been done. You're, you're, it's not going to happen. You're not going to just go, um, hmm, like dice, you know, oh, patience, look at me. I'm just suddenly patient. You're going to have to set your course for being patient. You're going to have to integrate not just every lesson in patience, but integrate the gratitude you feel for every time you pulled it off. God, that was, wow, that was amazing. I went to visit a friend, sat down, thought, so nice to be with my spiritual friends, and they turned on a certain news program. Oh, I can't believe it. They're so not spiritual. And you judge them, or you start judging yourself. You sit there just grinding your teeth. I'm judging them. Then you're losing something. You're missing something there. So you bounce back and go, wait, I was being impatient for a moment. You know why you'd be impatient? Because you forgot who you really are. If I know who I am, of course, in Miracles sort sort of puts it this way, that when we understand how everything is actually working, we can be very patient because we realize Everything's okay. Not the way things are, but the way things really are. The way things are, are only the way things seem to be. So when we say, you know, people say it's all good in the new age community. No, it isn't. That's actually incorrect. Oh, it's all good. It's all going to work out. Really? Okay. You're, you're incorrect. The world, three-dimensional world trying to run itself because it's all good. It is not all good. The three-dimensional world is run by minds that are not with good intentions. Right? Not, I mean, where's the cure for cancer? Because there's not as much money in a cure as a problem, a sickness. There's a lot of money in this. So why would they go, oh God, I just woke up. I'm in charge of all this. And I thought, you know, let's give them the cure for free. Tesla said, I can give every person in in the world an antenna to put out on their house or lawn and it'll create free energy. Everybody will have all the energy they ever need. Free. 
just from static electricity. Natural, organic, static electricity. It'll pick it up and run your house. He's dead. They killed him prematurely. They were like, this guy, we don't like him. He cuts into our profit margins. Don't tell me it's all okay. It's all good. The intentions are not good. But why? Because it's a fallen world. Why? Because the children of God forgot who they are and have come here and tried to run the world on um, metaphorically food, water, air. Where's the light? Why isn't that included as the natural component? You, ha you have to have the light. Not only the solar light, but God's light. I will never be able to fix, as Einstein said, problems of the world with the same mind that created them. Something's got to change. I don't know what, what, what's with these people. You know, to, how do you miss light? Even an academic scientist would be able to know that. Why is it not on these lists of the essentials of life? And I, I'm, not, they're not, I'm not even trying to assume they can get the God light piece. Just even sunlight. Because that's closer as a metaphor to the real light of God. So all the things we're looking for, you want to develop patience, you want to, you know, healing and forgiveness, all of them, same three steps. Set your course, integrate each change, lesson, learning that comes along the way, including, integrating includes giving thanks when it happened. And then, oh, unfortunately, and I'm saying that partly facetiously, stay the course. Because it isn't necessarily easy. Your ego doesn't say, oh, geez, somebody who set their course. I might as well just give up. It doesn't work that way. The way a criminal mind like the ego works is, as soon as it sees you adapted one direction, it simply morphs to constantly adapt, like the worst of all you know, uh, um, worm viruses in a computer. It doesn't say, oh, shoot, somebody got an antivirus program. We'll probably never bother them again. They go, well, we have to find something more clever, right? Mm -hmm. Something that'll ride antivirus programs into their computer. Like, let's just go piggyback onto it. They can figure these things out because nothing in this world lasts forever and nothing in this world is an answer all the way home. Only, only God and only the light of God. Does that mean I'm suggesting walking around being all pious and, you know, wear only white robes and kind of, you know, no, no, man, it, we're human beings. Let's enjoy being human beings. But set the intention that, that when you eat, when you sleep, when you make love, when you do the things of life, friendships, business, you know, just my intention though is to be in that center to the best of my ability. But when I slip, I have to own it because that's going back to the beginning of the three steps again. Go back and recognize it, access oops, and then what can I learn from that? And I will maintain my new course. It's just the micro adjustment of my new course, micro course adjustments. Or if I make major turns off the wrong lane, then major course adjustments. Just coming full circle again and again. Is that all making sense? To me, it's, um, <clears throat> it's beautiful how things can be kept simple and still explain so many different la layers or levels of conversation. Again, uh, uh, healing, one of you asked about patience, one, and still one conversation is covering all those pieces, including the book in Revelation that can turn sour. Um, yeah, and spontaneity. Um, we talked about that when I first started talking here about just the idea of how we can, we can live a life that, that is, I sort of think of it as a funnel of light at times when I think about God's presence. I just, I picture this funnel that pours down upon us within us and we become that light. But if you still think of Jesus as somewhere, sometime like a, a worshiped human, then you're not really setting your course to the highest. And you're not integrating what he said. Now, people will do that because they're afraid of owning that. What if I stand, here's the light of God right here, beaming onto the stage. Now, what if I really enjoy the light? I recognize the light. What if I'm good at describing the light? 
And I stood over here saying, so anyway, guys, look at the light. Isn't it beautiful? And that's a teacher about God. You see the difference? A teacher about God. Oh, look at, oh, did you see the sparkle? Oh, that's beautiful light over there. We've learned that that's called superstition. Not because it's inaccurate superstition. It's just that you're keeping it separate. What if you come over here, go the next stage, first set your course. I'm going to go and stand in the light. Ooh, that's pretty risky. Un then don't. Just stay over there and keep talking about it or denying that it's there. There is no light. There is no light. Everything's just science or academics or politics, and that's all that matters in the world. Well, then you live in darkness, as we've heard from many teachers in the past. But then there's the people who go, what if I go and stand in the light? Nice. So that choice to have a better life, to get out of addiction or whatever you're trying to do in your life, set some different course, is you technically, you may think it's about quitting an addiction, you may think it's about bettering your relationships, but really what you're doing underneath it all, because light is behind food, water, and air, what you're really saying is, I'm going to start standing in the light. Now, it's sad to me, to a degree, I think it's great that you're doing it, but it's kind of sad if you give it a title other than what it is. What are you doing? Well, I, I just thought I'd make some changes in my life, so um, I'm just wanting a new hairdo. And what you really are saying, I want more of God. But I'm so distant from that concept, I'm going to call it a hairdo? Really? And that's what you're doing. The makeovers and the surgeries and the whatever else, even getting a raise at work. What you really are calling for is more God. Honestly, you're really calling for more. But people don't know how to own that that's what they're calling for. All I really want is you, God. And I mean, I walk around my house and I would say things like that to myself because Nobody's listening. I can sound as insane as I want. So I can say, okay, sh oh, shoot, uh, I, uh, time for a shower. I could actually, on my way to the shower, go, this is great. Because on my way to the shower, I'm aware that this is about cleansing my soul, not just my body. That's the kind of conversations I can have. So either I'm really lonely or I choose to be awake. Whichever one you want to think it is. But just consider that. Consider that every time you get lost on a street somewhere, that it's a metaphor of feeling lost in your life. And when you redirect and get back on track, I wonder what that means. Wow. Wow, that was really weird because I got lost. You know what I did differently? I set my course. I'm going to get back on course. You know what I did differently? Time to integrate and learn lessons. I pulled over and said, excuse me, do you know where such and such a street is? That's different, but it's a metaphor of what? Asking for guidance. I like that, you say to yourself. I like that, wow, nice job. I'm going to remember that from here on, which means maintaining. Is that making sense? See, just so beautiful. So you recognize that everything's connected. Everything is, is a metaphor, without overanalyzing, but to see that there's that light. Wow, that light, either I deny that it's there or I recognize it. That's called atheist and that's called religion. Look at the light. I believe there's a light somewhere. And it's probably very pretty, God, this thing up in the sky. There's the person that won't believe, there's, and they're, so they're out of the light and living in darkness. And then there's religion that's theorizing about the light. They don't sound like they're theorizing. They, they speak as though they know, but they don't. And that's okay. They're speaking accurately that they're theorizing. We think that there's something. They don't say think. They say, oh, there is. If they knew, they would live different lives. So they're standing there talking about it and describing it differently. One of them will say it's a you know, bearded character. One of them is going to say it's this, and they're going to have different wording for it. It wants you to kneel when you pray, or it can't hear you, which would be really weird from an infinitely powerful being. It either means that it's incapable of something, like such as hearing your prayers, or that it's going la 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 and it doesn't want to hear your prayers. Neither of those makes any sense to a God. But how would I know if it's true if I'm over there and God's over here? So the next step is I'm, I'm going to initiate a change. I'm going to go stand in the light. 
What am I going to do while I'm standing in the light? I'm going to hopefully breathe some of it in, guys. That's called integrating. But I'm still breathing in light. Those are two separate things. I, light. You follow that? Integration is not all the way home. It means I'm getting there, becoming. But at some point in your prayers, meditations, ascension process, you notice, whoa, right? Like the ultimate Buddhist goal of who's speaking now? It's all disappeared. Being, not becoming, being. Wow, you know. And now somebody's going, there is no God. You're like, wow. You know, it's just like just being spiritually stoned. Just like, wow. <laughs> and then this person, God is a vengeful God. Wow. That's, 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 oh, man, that's totally a trip. Wow. You got any donuts to go with that? You know? It's like being spiritually stoned because it's like they're talking and you're like, I can't argue with them because I'm just blissing out. When you say, no, you're wrong. You're still over there arguing about what this would be like if you accessed it. So instead, integrate, integrate. I'm still in the process. I'm integrating. And then somebody says some ludicrous thing over here or over here about what God isn't and what God is. And I react. That's because I'm still learning. That means I'm a little insecure. That's not true. You know, and that's in your stages of 12 step. You're still a little vulnerable to temptation. You're still a little, you know, waffling here and there and wobbling here and there in your conviction. But you integrate, you integrate. You, you just start to go... The, I am, not I wonder, not, oh, I'm, 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 I'm starting to get it. There's the I am, it. But I still have to practice maintenance program, that third step. The maintenance program, as long as you're on earth, don't think, you know, because there are teachers that say, I'm completely realized, and then say, well, have you realized you're still here? <laughs> Try that on them, you know? I'm completely realized, really. I, 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 I never say anything like that. I don't bother correcting them. I don't need to because, you know. But to say you're completely realized, here's what I would like. You as my teacher, I want you to tell me, even if you are realized, I want you to say, you know what, it's a funny thing. I'm completely realized, and sometimes I don't realize it. <laughs> and so I slip. I like that. I personally admire teachers more like that than those who claim some beyond and, and now you're going into, you know, guruish status. You know, like um, I, I could be doing a talk right here and say, you know, I know you guys struggle on this planet because you, unlike me, you know, you still have an ego. But one day you're going to become like me. And you disrespectful humans are going to laugh at me. I mean that playfully. You're going to laugh at me because you know it's not true. Even if I seem like I've got it together and I live in the light, I do. But you can still see me. No, you can't. No, you can't. You know, that's denial. It's when people say, oh, how do you know when the ego's finally gone? First, there will be no capacity to incarnate again. Okay, I mean, it's close to impossible. Secondly, it's fairly simple. Walk in the snow, you won't leave tracks. Walk in the mud, you won't leave tracks. When you can look around and look back and go, oh, you know, remember the Shaolin Temple scene of the starting of Kung Fu TV show? When you leave, leave no tracks on the rice paper, you know? And then he does the walking, you know, the... Turns and finally one day he looks and it's all broken up and then one day he looks back, time for you to go. That's beautiful because that's a sign of, you know, you leave tracks. I mean, I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm just saying, why would you boast no ego when you still leave tracks? It's, it, and, and can you laugh at that and forgive yourself? You know, I mean, just down to the practical. It's not about not acting human that makes you divine. Jesus peed. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know why I said that. But somebody over there, what? You know, what did he... I shall not. It will all transmute within my being. True Christ embodied would be, of course, and I don't care. You know, he sits down and I know I have food you know not of, but he still ate with them at times. Did he say, I won't be needing that because I'm so above you people? No. He even taught when you sit and people break bread with you, eat the bread. Don't say, I'm just so holy. No, thanks. He drank wine. Even John the Baptist, as an Essene that he was, the Essenes were like, no liquor, no alcohol. And Jesus is hanging back, sitting with the, the Pharisees and sitting at other, sometimes going to parties, as it were, and he's, you know, drinking the wine with them. And they're like whispering, oh, see, now John, we kind of respected him so much that we had him killed. But John, we respected John because he didn't, you know, eat naughty foods and he didn't drink naughty liquors. And Jesus understood what they were thinking. Oh, I'm on to you people. Oh, what? I know what you're whispering. I know what you're thinking. He says to them, you guys are saying, you know, even John the Baptist lived a more austere and perfect life. Look at this guy claiming to be even higher up than John the Baptist. And he's, he's sitting here. He, he, hang, he hangs out with the tax collectors, which was considered a really low person at the time. And the prostitutes that were considered low people at the time. Gentiles that were considered lower people at the time. He's hanging out with these people and drinking wine with them. He said, I know what you're thinking. You're trying to compare and you're trying to say, well, this Jesus guy does these things. His point to us was, that's the Christ. The one that still does these human things, but doesn't see themselves as that thing. So then he uses the phrase, be in the world, not of the world. So I can drink the wine, but not need the wine. I can hug, but not need a hug. And that's, that's profound stuff. It's just to not need. But if I ever see the thought come up to judge myself, to do those things, my job is to forgive myself, not to shame myself. That's old school. You know, and it's like it became a, a thing for people to get all weird about Jesus doing these human naughty things. And it was mainly the priests that were having these conversations with him. You should not be, you should not be. How could you dine with harlots? He's saying, you're all harlots too. They're just honest about it. They'll charge me if I go to them. They're honest about it. You guys are going to call it a love offering. And you're still harlots. You all wear these long garments. You all take them off when you want. But one says, this is what I am. This is what I do. And their job, he says, I'm talking to them. First of all, because they're more fun to hang around. But also, because if I hang with them and say, you know what? No matter what you've done, if you forgive yourself, you're good to go. You guys that say we do no wrong, you're an extra huge step away from reaching Christ consciousness. Do you see why? We do no wrong. I'm already ascended. I'm already amazed. I'm realized. He's saying to you, when you have that attitude, believe it or not, you have more problems than the person full-blown attitudes that says, I don't know how to do this. On their knees in a 12-step program saying, I can't do this alone. That humility is actually what gets you home. Because it's the humility that takes you to the consciousness of forgiving yourself. Not because you're going to own that you're a bad person, although some people start that way. Oh, I'm naughty, I'm bad, and I need to call in Jesus as my Savior. It's been proven time and again that scared straight programs do not have a lasting effect. And people that find religion, and there are lots of people in religion, far more than in spiritual things like this, experiences like this. Why? Because fear still speaks louder than truth. I don't want to think. I just want you to tell me I'm going to go to hell if I don't change. Then I'm going to make a change. And I'll hide all my naughtiness. You should just call it partying. But now I'm religious, so I don't tell anybody. That's not further along. So, so at the end of the day, set a new course. Change your life. Change it one degree, 100 degrees, any amount. Be careful. Don't try to initiate more than you can handle, because if you don't make it there and on this planet, we often don't, 
you're going to be tempted to shame yourself and feel worse than when you started. Set your course to new life. We're coming towards the fall. Let some things go that you no longer would like in your life that don't resonate where you want to go. Go and change everything all at once. A little too much burden, guys. But make some changes you're willing to change. So, you know, you're willing to commit to. Drop them, if possible, and call in something new. When you do, give thanks and integrate every change you've made. Give thanks to yourself. God, this is great. And I feel better. And I, any wording that works for you. Jesus or Christ or God or Holy Spirit. But talk to the Creator. Go to the light behind food, water, air. Find your way. I'm not a teacher that's going to tell you do it this way or there's no other way. Find your way. I'm a bridge. You know, and that's all I'm going to is to tell you. Do something to take you that direction. Religion for too long has copyrighted and registered, trademarked the, the way. And it wasn't. So now it's better to say, you know what? Do something you'll commit to and God will spe be speaking to you anyway. As you stand in the light, you'll be guided as to what next steps to take. So use any part of what we talked about today, including standing in that light. Do you want to deny the light or hear people denying it? Just hold your presence for a moment. Just remember that simple thing. Instead of getting annoyed by them, oh, oh, that's one of those. Over here, the preachy ones, oh, that's them. React to them, react to them, and you didn't hear this talk. You know, instead of reacting to them, what do I want to do? I want to stand in the light. Okay, great, you set your course. Now what? I'm going to start giving thanks for each moment that I see I pull that off, that I hold that light, that presence. And how do you do so? Prayer, meditation, etc. Good. You're going to see the effect, just like what, what I do when I say, you know, what kind of uh, conversations, what do you want to talk about today? Boom, 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 the light, boom, and it all happens. You know, it just kind of happens. But I maintain it for the talk. That's good. I also do my best to hold that when I walk out the door. It won't be perfect all the time, and it certainly won't be perfect in other people's opinions when you make that attempt. To you, it might be beautifully living the light, but you could go home and say, you know what? I'm letting go of unhealthy things. Some of those people that are called unhealthy are going to say, you're all messed up. You have to be to thine own self, true, okay? but. Please be patient with yourself. Set your intention, yes, but be patient. Busy yourself with integrating and giving thanks and not getting distracted. But remember, you'll have to continue living it once you even get it. You've got to continue living it. There's a lot in this world that's going to try to mess with your head. Do your best to maintain even in those dark times. And ultimately, it'll make it most easy of all if you call on a higher power to assist you. When you say, no, no, I'm going to make this happen on my own, you are again affirming, I don't need God, I'll get this. Even though it sounds spiritual, it's not. Remember the value of humility. We're going to do our closing prayer, please. Thanks for staying the extra few minutes. Please stand if you don't mind. You don't have to. It's optional. And the folks online, stand, sit, kneel, lie down, whatever you'd like to do that's most comfortable. Just know whatever position we stand or sit in, we're still doing this process together. First, breathing in gratitude, integrating what we gained from today. Wow, so beautiful, so powerful. Hmm. And also, even if we think we know better about health, masks, no masks, you know what? I'm very sorry that some of our brothers and sisters are in any way scared or sick. They're not lesser. It's us. So to all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world, the ones that are afraid and trying to win an election, bless you, the ones that will not win, whatever, they're all us. All I truly wish for everyone is the love and peace of God. And not only will I wish it for, I being all of us, not only will I wish it for all of them, family members and everyone else, I'm affirming that it's already there. And that the layers begin to peel away now so we can see it, feel it, experience it. 
<clears throat> the light of God surrounds us. We are the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. We are the love of God. The power of God protects us. We are the power of God. And the presence of God watches over us. We are the presence of God. Wherever we go, God, God is, <laughs> I am, we, we are, are, and so it is. Thanks, guys. Peace be with all of you. Thank you. You're welcome.